All right, let's get started. So last Thursday, I guess most of you were here, we started talking about trees, which are our first truly nonlinear. Um, is there feedback, or is this OK? And there's feedback. <laughs> OK. Anyway, so we talked about regression trees last week. I want to finish up the trees unit by talking about classification trees. It will take, I think, at most the first half, probably less. And then we can talk about questions you guys might have for the short test tomorrow. Um, some people posted on Piazza. And then we can see if you guys have questions uh, that you want to ask. I think at this stage of the game, I might focus. If you haven't already reviewed the lecture slides, I would probably go back over the slides at this point and maybe the statements of the problems from the homework, just to refresh. If you haven't already done that, that's probably what I would do in a limited amount of remaining time. All right, classification trees. So quick review on what a tree looks like. We have, we're dealing with binary trees, where at each node we pick one feature. We're dealing with continuous features right now, or ordered features, and we choose a split point, and we go left to right, depending on what side of the split that feature is on. And as we go down the tree, we eventually reach leaf nodes. And each leaf node corresponds to a particular rectangular or kind of or in higher dimensional, the analog of a rectangle, a rectangular region that gets a particular prediction. Every, input, every element of the input space that falls into a particular region, parallel piped region, that would correspond to a leaf node, has a single prediction that's produced, the same prediction. And then for regression, it's going to be we found the average of the y values in the leaf nodes. And then for classification, what do you think it would be for classification? Bless you. So in our training set, we found all of the uh, labeled data points that fall in, say, R5. And this is now a classification problem. So there's going to be some of class 1, some are going to be a class 2, some are going to be a class 3. Which class should we predict? Majority. Yeah, the majority. So when we want to predict on a new example that happens to also fall into R5, we will predict with whichever class showed up the most frequently in R5 in our training set. Very natural, straightforward. Any questions on that setup? All right, well, almost done. Um, OK, so the general tree building procedure is we start at the root. We look at our features. We choose a splitting variable. It's a particular feature. And then we we'll split point, and that splits our input space into two regions, R1 and R2. So compared to the regression trees that we did last week, we're going to need to modify a couple things. One is how we split the nodes, and then how we prune. But we're not going to talk about, we'll briefly mention how we're going to prune for classification trees. It's basically the same. So let's see how we're going to do that. So it's no extra cost, really, to consider um, k classes as opposed to just binary classes. So we'll do a k-way k classification tree. And let's consider a d-dimensional input space. And so our splitting variable is choosing one of these d variables to split on. And let's continue to consider real-valued features. So we're gonna, the split point will also be a real value. And then some notation. We had r1 and r2 for the region of the input space that's to the left of the split point and to the right of the split point. All right. All right, so a little bit more notation. We're going to, so when I say a node, what am I referring to a node of the tree? So let's say, but I'm saying it represents a region Rm. We're mostly, we're interested at this point in like leaf nodes, where we actually care about the regions of the input space that are um, associated with that node. All right, so suppose we have um, region Rm. Rm is the points that fall into the mth region or the mth leaf nodes, and there's n sub m points in that 
in that region in the training set. And let's, let's define the proportion of um, items in the training set of class K out of all of them, out of the, oh, another bug. This should be, what should this be instead of M, if you're following me? This is counting up how many items of class K we have in region RM. And we're dividing by something because we want to come up with a relative proportion. Yeah, good. And this should be N sub M instead of M. Good, you're following. So we're going to call that P hat MK. It's the proportion of class K in node M. Clear? OK. All right, and so our prediction is going to be looking for whichever which class proportion is the highest, right? Good. Good, so that's going to be the arg max over K of P hat M sub K. So K is the class, M is the region. Very good. So we want to predict, we're going to predict K of M. We could also, that's when we want to predict a single class. We could also predict the whole probability distribution. Why not? They're the obvious things. You predict the relative proportions of each class. So now we have, almost for free, we can predict whole distributions of our classes using the proportions in the node. Cool. All right, so now. We've set up how we're going to do our predictions. Let's go back to predicting a single class for a node. How can we compute our, class, misclass, our expected misclassification rate for a particular node? Suppose, for example, we're predicting KM because it had the highest p hat m sub k, the highest proportion. Based on this training set, what would we expect the misclassification rate for an input element that falls into the mth region of the space, or the mth node of the tree. Yeah, I'd say 1 minus p hat mk. Right? If in our leaf node, 30% of the training examples were of class 2, and that was more than all the other ones, maybe it was like 5% class 1, 8% class 2, and there's lots of, a lot of spread, and 30% happened to be the highest, there must be a lot of classes. Well, probability of error is maybe like 70%. If 30% were of the class we're predicting, 70% were not. So that's, that would be our estimated probability of error for that prediction. Is it clear? All right. Yeah, 1 minus p hat mk. All right. So we know how to figure out what we're predicting once we have the, the splits, the partition of the space. So what's left is how do we partition the space? How do we figure out the splitting variable? And how do we figure out um, where to split it? And what we're going to talk about is how to evaluate how good the split is. All right. And there's lots of ways to do that, actually. Um, do you guys have any ideas? Whoa. OK, some, you're very good. Entropy, information, gain, yeah. So uh, good inventions. That's, I would not have come up with that. That's impressive. Very good. Uh, what I would have thought of off the top of my head would be um, a misclassification rate. right? So if there's a particular split, you can estimate the probability of misclassifying a prediction based on that one split. Right? So that's one way to measure it. And then there are fancier things which we'll end up preferring. That's right. So we call these, these measures of how good the split is, this node impurity measure. And that's getting towards the idea that we really want to head towards leaf nodes that have, we want most of the training examples to be concentrated on one class so that when we predict that class, we're correct. Um, all right. So that's, that certainly explains the leaf nodes. But misclassification error would, would be OK with that, too. Misclassification error is basically what, um, what I said we want to optimize. But there's a little bit more to it. We want to have this notion of node purity. So we'll look at a couple of uh, pictures. All right. So we want as close to a single class in a node as possible. And then it's just a matter of how do you measure that. All right. OK, so this is a plot of different measures in a situation that we have binary class, so two classes. 
And the x-axis is p, which is the relative proportion of, say, class 1 in the training data. And um, what we want, so the worst, what's the worst possible relative proportion of the best class? Yeah, for two classes, 0.5. That's like complete uncertainty. You're, that's the worst possible error rate you can get for two classes. Right. And the best would be 0 or 1. And so if we look at this, uh, you think of these as losses or impurities, things we want to minimize, then the best is at the extreme, 0 and 1. So we, want, we want to, certainly want to encourage totally pure nodes. And 50-50 is the worst. And then there's different penalties in between. All right. OK. So these are, these are the actual uh, formula giving those curves in two dimensions. Here they're generalized in two, for two classes. Here they're generalized decay classes. Um, I think you'll have some opportunity to kind of get used to these things and f get a feel for them in the homework, in the next homework. Um, the first one is simply misclassification error. Um, this one is called the Gini index. It looks a little bit familiar. It feels a little bit like the measure of variance of a Bernoulli variable. Right? It's kind of like a variance type thing. This, on the other hand, is, is kind of like an entropy. Well, this is the entropy. This is the entropy of a, of a they call it cross entropy for various reasons. But I wrote entropy because this is the entropy of the distribution represented by the relative proportions of each of the classes. All right, so here's a picture. So on the left, we have our data comes from four classes. And on the right is the uh, relative proportions of the four classes overall, even splits, right? All right, so now let's test out one particular split. Let's start with the one on the top. So we're splitting right down the middle from left to right. So we have the top half and the bottom half. This little histogram here is the relative proportions of red, blue, and yellow, as are in the top half. Can you see this? There's no green up. Uh, there's no green anywhere, is there? <laughs> All right, I have to refine my color descriptions because green is not coming out on, this, on the projector. <laughs> <laughs> so these were green if you're looking on your computer. But on the screen, we'll call them yellow. And these are orange. <laughs> Aren't they? Darker yellow. Darker yellow. Golden. All right, so we have mustard color here, <laughs> but no yellow. And here we have yellow, but no mustard. All right, fine. Now let's compare to the one on the bottom. So on the bottom, we have only two classes pretty evenly split. And on the right, we have two classes evenly split. Intuitively, roughly, maybe the bottom one's better because we have fewer classes. We've at least gotten rid of two classes from each. Well, the measure itself, here they've, we've written information gain, which is actually um, directly related to entropy. But big information gain is small entropy. There's a little formula for it. So this has larger information gain, so smaller entropy. So this would be the per preferred split over this one, according to the entropy measure. Um, OK. Maybe I can give a quick, better example of why you might prefer something with higher entropy. Suppose we had, um, let's use the same number of classes, four classes. And suppose we had a split that gave us, let's just look at one half of the split. So two classes that are almost exactly equal. Maybe this one's a little bit higher. Versus another one, which was, this is exactly the same. So let's say this is uh, 0.51. This is 0.49. Oh boy. 4.8 and 5.2. And then this one is also 0.52. And then suppose this split had the same weight spread equally over two classes. And each of these are 0.24. OK? All right. So 
what's the probability of misclassification for each of these situations? Say again? It's the same. It's 0.48, whether it's this or this. Um, which one do you think you would prefer? I think this one, because we've already gotten rid of one class entirely. It feels, all right, so that's intuitive. And then, OK, mathematically, under entropy, which of these distributions has higher entropy? This bottom one, why? OK, well, you have to know, for starters, that um, entropy is maximized over a distribution over a, a finite set of elements has maximal entropy when it's a uniform distribution spread evenly among all of them. So this you have to know uh, to reason about this example. Well, OK, given that kind of conditional that we're in these two classes, splitting the weight equally between these two classes has far more entropy than splitting the weight unequally with all the weight on just one of the classes. So condition on we have 0.4 probability on these two classes the maximum entropy is to split it evenly. OK. So if we minimize the entropy, we're more like this. And this kind of tells you why you want maybe to do something better or more, more than just misclassification rates. Cool. Any questions on that? OK. Well, that's the idea. So then all that's left is how do you find the split? Um, now that we know, well, we know rough, roughly how to evaluate it. There's some details I didn't tell you about how to evaluate this split, right? Let's, let's, let's hope that that's in the next slide. <laughs> all right. So we have our splits, RL and RR for left and right, um, and the number of points, NL, RL. Let Q of RL and Q of RR be the node impurity measures for the two splits. So it's either going to be the entropy, or it's going to be misclassification rate, or it's going to be um, the genie. And so each split gives us two scores, one for the left side and one for the right side. So the question is, how do you combine them? Yeah, you could just add them. Uh, the issue, potentially, is that what if one side of the split has far more points than the other one? Yeah, so what we do is we take a weighted average, weighted by the number of points in each. Exactly. So we look for a, so here's the weighted average. So the number of points on the left side times the impurity measure of the left plus the number of points on the right times the impurity measure of the right. And we search for a split that maximizes or minimizes this. Minimizes, minimizes this because it's impurity. Right. We want to minimize the entropy, minimize the misclassification rate. So we're going to minimize this over all splitting variables and all splitting points. OK, so do you have, do you, we know how to do this? We talked about roughly how to do this last time. And I guess the question is, does the insight we made last time apply to today? So first of all, how did we decide to do it last time? So let's suppose we pick a particular variable to split on. The question is, what points do we use for the split? And the insight was that you don't have to check you know, every real value in the range. You only have to check the split points that are aligned with the actual values yeah. attained by the input points on that feature. Because if you have two points here and here that are adjacent, there's no other points between these two, then it doesn't matter where between those two you split it. They all give the same split. So you only have to check the, the possible split points that align with a value of a training point. OK. So does the same, does the same approach work here when this is what we're optimizing? Yes? Does it make sense to um, apply the, the middle value between two actual values? OK, that's interesting. So the question is, does it make sense to put the split right in the middle of the two adjacent values? Ah, I like that question. Yeah. So, all right. So the intuition would be, um, okay, it doesn't make any difference on the training set, but maybe if you're maximally distant between those two points, it might actually perform better on the test set. That's interesting. I'll, 
I, I buy the intuition. You'd have to try it out, see if it matters. Right, anyone else have a thought on that? Good. OK. All right, so as we kind of mentioned, genie and entropy are the preferred methods for growing the tree because they tend to get um, more pure nodes. All right, remember last time there was a second step. So we build the tree out, and we have some stopping criterion for when we stop splitting nodes. And that was, for example, when a node has fewer than a fixed number of training examples, we stop splitting it, so 5, 10, something like that. But then that potentially overfits. We want to control the complexity. So then the second stage, this is, this is the method of CART. The second stage is to prune back these nodes. And when we prune, we can either you, if you remember last time, what we were doing is we were, the first step of pruning was to find the node to prune, a single node to prune, that would reduce the risk by as little as possible. Remember that? And then we found the next one to prune that reduced the risk by as little as possible. Reduced the risk. Increased the risk. Increased the risk by as little as possible. Increased the training error by as little as possible. So, we, so that was for square loss. So there it was very clear. Here, what should we do? We can find the node to prune that would increase the impurity by as little as possible. Um, we could do that. Uh, should we, should we, if we build it with Genie, should we prune with Genie? If we build it with entropy, should we prune it by looking at entropy too? Feels like intuitively to me, once you're already built out, we, we use these other impurity measures because they, they made the splits have properties that were appealing, like they were pure. But once we've already built the tree, and now we're at the pruning stage, the splits are already set. And now we should focus our sight on what we're actually trying to optimize, which is not actually the impurity measure. It's the, it's the training error. It's the classification. It's the misclassification error. We want to minimize the misclassification rate. So when you prune, it makes a lot of sense to prune using the misclassification rate as your, cri as your criterion instead of the impurity measure. You guys buy that? It's pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, okay. So that's, that's all I had to say about classification trees specifically. I had one additional comment on trees in general that I don't think I made last time. Um, so it's that trees make no use of geometry. So what do we mean? For linear methods, all the methods we, and all the methods we talked about what, that were kernelizable, um, we basically were making use of an inner product in the input space, where you know we have this W, the weight vector, and we have an input example x, and we take the inner product between them, and we come up with a number, and maybe we add a bias, but um, and. If you can visualize, so the inner product is kind of a, represents a geometry of the space. It tells you about angles, and it could tell you about lengths. Um, and it also, it's a way to, re, to kind of directly, well, I'll leave it at that. In trees, there's nothing like that at all. There's no structure of the space that you're using except one thing. What's the one thing we're assuming about the input space for trees? as we've presented it. What, what does the input space need to have? What characteristics? Say again? Yeah, so, yeah. We built it up in RD, or so it's called RD, because we've been using D. OK. Um, could we relax it from R? So there's reals. Can we, what if it's just replace reals by any set that has an order to it? Does that work? Do we need a? A measure? Why do, where does a measure come in? That's a measure not on x, but on y. 
misclassification rate is a measure is about y. So what, do we need any structure on the feature space? Yes, we need, we need an ordering to the elements of the set. So when we pick a particular element of the set, we can split on that element and say, are you less than or equal to it or greater than it? So we need, each feature has to be in, so let's say the i feature has to be in a set s sub i, where s sub i has a nice little relationship less than or equal to. Is there anything we would need for this SI, this space for the ith feature to have besides an inequality? What? I don't think we use the distance. Do we use the distance anywhere? So no. That's what's so neat about trees, is that this is all you need. So if you can put an order on it, you're set. Um, even without order, what happens if you have a set SI with no order? You can't use some of the tricks we discussed. You can't, um, you, you no longer choose a split point that no longer makes sense without an order. In this case, you have to actually choose the whole partition. So, but you can do that. You can say, I will choose a subset of SI to be left, and the rest will be right. And they're not really related by left by a relation, relation, but you can still build a tree in that way. And that is how you handle categorical variables as opposed to real variables. So the algorithms for that are, um, are, they are efficient when there's only two values to the categorical variable. And um, it gets more complicated when you have lots of values for the categorical. Okay. Yes. How do you choose between genie and entropy? Uh, I would test on validation. I don't have an intuition on when one is more useful than the other. Which is fine in our setup. It's fine to not know what's better. You just use the computer time to Try both. Yeah, let the computer do your work. I mean, it's nice to have intuition, but you don't need it to move on. Yeah. OK, so no geometry, no inner products, no distances. It's called a non-metric method. Metric is distance between two things. Here's a very important thing. Feature scale is completely irrelevant. There's no measure of the size of a feature. So in particular, things like Centering and scaling your variables, or normalizing, or whitening, completely ir irrelevant for features, as long as you're doing it with one feature at a time. Completely irrelevant for trees, because it doesn't care. It only cares about the ordering. Yeah. Um, and this is important when trees become, you won't necessarily use trees, well, you'll use trees from, from time to time, but you'll especially use them for things like random forest and boosting as constituent elements. And all these properties of trees carry on to ensembles of trees. So if you're doing random forest, which we'll talk about probably next week, um, you don't have to rescale your variables or center them or anything like that. Okay. And here's the last thing, which is um, and this is relevant to the regression trees. The predictions are they're not they're not smooth. They are they're piecewise constant. So this may or may not be desirable in your context. OK. Um, that's all I had to say about trees. So the rest of the time is yours to see how to best prepare you for the test tomorrow. Um, May I ask a last question about trees? Yeah, please. We only talked about the binary trees. In Wait, not yours to like chat, but like. <laughs> All right, go on. In each split, we either go left or right. Might there be a, a structure where we can have more than? Yes, OK, multi-way trees. Um, 
Yeah, I, those exist. Um, I don't see them being used too often, but that's, but I don't work in a world where trees are often used. OK, so um, for my personal needs and you know, the textbooks that we're looking at, right? We look, I've been looking at a lot of textbooks to bring things together. It's pretty much about binary trees. So, yeah. What else? OK. Um, let me say one thing that's on my mind about the test tomorrow, just so it's for you to keep in mind. Um, the test might be long for, for some of you. Um, and the problems are, you know, some may be easy and some may be hard, and they might be interspersed. So you have to be flexible. And if you get to a problem and you're kind of stuck, you need to move on and get through it and go back through it. Okay. So don't, um, right, maybe you'll find them all straightforward, but you know, don't feel like you need to go, you're, you can skip. And that might be the best strategy, you know, depending on, you know, maybe some areas of the course are stronger than the others. So do those first. All right, so some of you guys posted some questions. All right. All right, so the first, this is a test question from last year. The question was very confusing. I don't actually think I ended up counting it last year on the true false. But anyway, let's talk about it. So. True or false? If the empirical risk function is not convex, more training data may not help estimation error. It's confusing. Let's break it up into pieces. So the second piece, training data, estimation error. What's estimation error, first of all? Yeah, you're all, everyone think about it. OK, this is our space of all possible functions. F star is the Bayes optimal. This is our hypothesis space that we're going to choose a function from. This point is the point that minimizes what kind of error? Approximation error, right. So the point that's closest to the Bayes optimal in the hypothesis space is minimizing the approximation error. Does this point depend on the training set? Right, it doesn't depend on the training set. It just depends on the hypothesis space that we're in. So we can write that like f star sub h to say it's restricted to h. All right, now at this point, what do I have in mind for this point? It's the point in h that minimizes what kind of error with respect to f star of h? Estimation error. So the idea is that we want to, if we, restri we restrict to h, why do we restrict to h? Why did we introduce the hypothesis space in the first place? What were we concerned about? Overfitting, Overfitting yeah. So if we just should try to find the best f among all functions for our training data, we are prone to overfitting. So we restrict to a hypothesis space. Now we'd love to find the best function in the hypothesis space, but we don't have enough data to really find the best. So we find the best according to our data. It's minimizing the empirical risk. And the gap between this point we find, which is going to be f hat and f star h, the difference in the risk for those two things, that's the estimation error. OK. And what's this thing I drew? Why did I draw one more thing? Optimization error, exactly, right. So you have some algorithm to try to find f hat. And maybe it's an, an approximate algorithm, or maybe you don't run it all the way to convergence, or for whatever reason, it doesn't get to f hat. Even though you had the data to find a fat, you just didn't have the computing patience or whatever to find it. OK, so that's a little additional error, optimization error. OK, now, more training data and estimation error. What's the relationship? 
more training data should reduce estimation error because you're getting closer to the your empirical risk estimate of the true risk is converging to the true risk, hopefully. Okay. All right. So more training data should help estimation error. Now, how does convexity come in? In what of the three types of errors, optimization error, estimation error, approximation error, which would convexity be most relevant to? I would say optimization error because convexity is what gives you effective iterative algorithms to minimize the empirical risk or whatever your objective function is. So convexity is relevant to this optimization error and is maybe, except in some very abstruse ways, not relevant to the estimation error. Okay. So I think I meant this question to be easy in the sense that the second half of the question, the second half of the statement is about estimation error, and the first half is convexity, which have nothing to do with it. So there should be false, but it's rather confusing. So anyway. All right. Any questions on that? All right, someone else asked a good question. It's kind of in, and if the person's here, maybe they can clarify it if this isn't getting to it. So we talked about subgradient descent methods, right? And there was this interesting thing we said about subgradient, which was that it's not a descent method, right? So the subgradient, you pick a subgradient and you look in the negative subgradient direction, and if you go in that direction, f may not decrease. And we had an example on the slides of, of that happening, a picture. Well, OK. But we proved this amazing thing, which is that even if f doesn't decrease, the distance between where we started and where we ended up, the distance between, well, the, distance between the point where we started and the true minimizer, or w star, gets smaller when we move to the next point. All right? So, that was very interesting. So the question was, how is that possible? How can we continually be moving closer and closer to the optimal W star, but F not decrease? And it's not that F never decreases when you take a step. It's that we're not guaranteed that it will decrease in any particular step. Is there any more to that question? Yes? You mean how? It is. Well, that's, that's what's interesting, is that you, it's not the case. So it's possible to be moving closer to the minimum, but actually moving, get, having f be increasing. Yeah. It's not a local minimum. So, no, this is true for a convex, this, we're talking about convex functions here. So there's no local minima at all. Um, is, is what we proved that eventually it goes to W star, but every individual step might not? Or not? The distance between me and W star before the step and after the step, after the step I'm closer to W star. That we proved, that's for sure. So. But f of w0 and f of w1, that may be an increase. Yes, it may be an increase. But if we're eventually going to get to w star, f has to decrease eventually, because f of w star is smaller than f of where we started. So we might do a little bit of uphill before we go downhill. So I can load the picture. We had a picture of it, yeah. You don't like the picture? The, the phrasing was a little uh, weird to I think that you said that it must, the function must increase if we go in the opposite direction of the subgradient. The question was if we go in the opposite direction. Well, question, it was the way that my statement it. was yeah. that. It was, it was just you know, one word that made it seem like it always happened. I said it aloud or it's in the slides? It's in the slides. OK. Well, let's get to the bottom of that. <laughs> All 
All right, where do I say this? Subgradients, not a descent direction. Okay, not guaranteed to be a descent direction. No, this is for this for this specific G oh. in this specific example for that specific function at that specific point. Okay. Moving in the negative G direction increases the function. Okay. So the so that we can see from the picture. So negative G is moving this way, which is so this is the minimum of the function, and it increases as we cross these lines. This is right every line we cross, it's gone up a step. So this is moving from this contour line away from it, which is in a direction where it's getting bigger. All right. Now you're just asking, how, why should, how do I know this is the subgradient? OK. Um, so sure. Okay, suppose we are here. All right, so the, what's the direction from this point of moving where things increase the most quickly? Would it be this way? This way? No. The way, the direction that this, that we would increase most quickly is this way. I mean, I have to draw an extra line to be sure, but. Do you, uh, do you agree with that? But we have a third dimension, right? The input space is two-dimensional, and then there's the value of the function. So this is this is a, this is an imp this is an input space of R two. So the third dimension is represented by the contour lines in some sense. So uh, should I continue to explain the subgradient thing? So. At this point, this is the gradient for this function. And then when we get to this corner, all these points are subgradients because, well, Because they are bounded by the, so the subgradient, the subdifferential is going to be this kind of convex combination of the all convex combination, the convex hull of the gradients of these these parts. So there's this gradient for this part and this gradient for this part, and the subdifferential is going to be the convex hull of those gradients. Anyway. This is a bit off our track. Um, like, <laughs> this is getting pretty uh, analytical. Um, but I think you should understand the picture. So my understanding of your question at this point is, I don't really understand subgradients geometrically. Yeah. Yes, any subgradient, if you any g that's a subgradient, if you go in the negative g direction, you're fine. Sorry. If you go in the direction of the gradient, that's a, if you have a gradient, and you go in the direction of the gradient, that's the maximal increase in the function value. The negative gradient is the maximum decrease. Okay, so now what were you asking? That's right. G is not a gradient. 
so we don't have that nice property that minus g decreases the function. No, My, moving in the minus g gets you closer to the minimum, but it does not decrease the function. Yes? All right, well, first of all, did you believe that this was the only gradient here? Yeah. I couldn't draw this, right? OK. So, um, so the question is, so what exactly is the question? Why can't I draw this here? Yeah. But this is not a, I mean, if I just do epsilon to the left, this is not a gradient. The only, if I go epsilon to the left of here, only this is the gradient. OK, start over. Say it again. So we're So if, OK, so I can get at that several ways. First of all, if you believe our proof, which we went through in one slide, which was nice, if you move in a negative gradient direction, we're getting closer to the minimum. So from that perspective, the only things that get us closer to the minimum are, from here, are things that go like in this direction. So the so for those of you the negative gradient directions, that's the opposite of these. So if you so from a perspective of we know the negative subgradient must move us closer to the minimum, that's a bound already. We can't if the subgradient were this way, that would have us moving this way, which is away from it, which is proved we, we cannot do that by our theorem. So that's one explanation, kind of a backwards explanation. Not really. So if I'm if I go this way? Yeah, uh, like a little bit uh, as long as the distance between uh oh sorry. Okay. Well, yeah. It looks like it's not in this form actually. See that then on the, the angle is just like a very small angle and uh, Yeah, I didn't draw the same picture here. So there's this more flat, right? So what's the so this is the gradient here? Well, it's not as easy to tell. Yeah. All right, let's, let's not get too wrapped up into subgradients anymore. We can, uh, I just want to make sure there's not other questions that are more addressable. I mean, you, you have the facts, right? You know the definition of subgradient. You know the theorem about subgradients that it moves you closer to the minimizer. Um, so these are your basic tools. So. OK, let me get back to you with a better explanation than I'm giving you now. Good question. Yes.
Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. So the question is, um, and we'll take a break right after this. The question is, perception is a definitive algorithm, right? It's, we go in, and, and then the problem on homework three was show that this is a subgrading descent algorithm. But when you take a subgradient, you have some choice on which subgradient you choose. And in particular, where things are not differentiable, there's some question mark. And so for this problem, um, you have to choose the right subgradient to get it to match exactly with perceptron. Now, for Pegasus, which is the SVM one, uh, I don't remember. Did we give you a, a different choice of the subgradient for that? Because it doesn't matter. Right, right. OK. So for the case of SVM, of Pegasus, this is, Pegasus is kind of like the right way to do stochastic subgrading descent on an objective function. And what's key there is that our step size is decreasing over time according to a particular formula for which we have theorems. And as long as we're choosing a subgradient at every point, it will do well. It will do fine. So. For Pegasus, we could have chosen any subgradient instead of the one we chose. And it's all fine. Perceptron now. Perceptron is a recipe, originally, for how to adjust things at every step. And it just you could say it just so happens to be the subgradient, for a particular subgradient of the perceptron loss. Well, what happens? If, so what happens if we took the step to be 0 whenever the subgradient were at a non-differentiable point? First of all, at what point is the perceptron not differentiable? 0, what is 0? The what? OK. So if our prediction, so our prediction for perceptron is W transpose x, the margin is going to be y w transpose x. And then we have the loss function, which is not differentiable. So we have a loss, a margin loss. What's the margin loss for the perceptron? OK. Max of? Ooh. What's the margin? How's that? Does it agree with what you're saying? OK. Great. So when is this not differentiable? At m equals 0, or this equals equal to 0. OK. Good. All right. So what happens if we choose the subgradient? So 0 is a valid subgradient of the perceptron at m equals 0, of the perceptron loss. So that means when we get to a point where m is equal to 0, and we take a subgradient, and if we choose 0, what's our step? No step. OK. So what happens if we choose 0 as our subgradient at that point? We won't be updating w in that iteration. For that, and that iteration corresponds to a specific point. And what's going on with that point? That point has margin 0. It's not being classified at all. It doesn't, yeah, so the prediction on that point is 0. The, and the margin is 0. So what's that mean corresponding to the predicted hyperplane or something? It's on the hyperplane. So we did terribly on that point. We're completely indecisive. We don't even have anything we're producing. So it sure seems like a better idea to take a step at that point than to stay where we are. OK. So. Pegasus doesn't have this issue because it's using an SVM loss, which is not satisfied with being on the margin. There's a loss if you're 
if your margin is zero. There's a loss if your margin is a half. It's getting your points, it's penalizing you until your points have margin one or more, right? So that's why we're okay. That's why we're okay taking any subgradient um, in the Pegasus place because if you get stuck on the margin for SVM, what's the margin for SVM? On the margin is one. The non-differentiability in SVM is at one. Well, who cares if you're stuck at one? That's fine. And then as far as your question of from Piazza, you know, are we ever going to find points on the margin? Yes, we will find points on the margin. Because when something gets to the margin, we're not necessarily going to update it because it has no, if we're using a subgradient zero, then we're not going to update it at that point. The question is, if there are points on the hyperplane, does that mean the data are not linearly separable? Um, well, there's two questions. If I just give you a hyperplane, I just give you a hyperplane and there are points on the hyperplane, no, it doesn't say anything about the data. If I say this is the best possible hyperplane you could come up with in a certain sense, and there's still points on the hyperplane, I would say that, um, well, it depends what I meant by best possible. So it's, a, it's a good question. Why don't you think about it? If, it? if I minimize the SVM loss and there's points in the hyperplane, then the data is not separable. That's true. That's what I'll say about that. Right, let's take a break. All right. So. There's an interesting problem, question over break. Who asked me that question? Yeah. What was the question again? Um, the first question on the recap slide. Um, yeah. Is it, is it possible to use under, the, is it possible to add a feature? OK, right. So you have a, an, an input space, a set of features, and you're doing, was it linear regression or unregularized linear regression on a particular set of features? and you add a feature. And the question is, can the empirical risk, can the training loss get worse? Right? And OK. And the, or it was said, um, it, will, it will never get worse. And the scary part is never. Like, is there any exception to this never getting worse when you add a feature? Um, but it's not too scary, because you have to picture hypothesis spaces, right? So, so we have the input space x. And then we have some features that give us a hypothesis space h1. The hypothesis space is a subset of all functions, right? This is a su particular subset of all functions that we get. Let's consider them as like functions of x. So if we add a new feature, the space of possible functions we can do on x cannot get smaller. Adding a new feature can never restrict the number of the amount number of functions that we have access to. Is that clear? So if we add a new feature, you know, we're gonna get it might be the same size, but in general it could be bigger. And then we're minimizing, we're finding the best fitting function in these two spaces. So if the space gets bigger, or at least doesn't get smaller, then the best can't possibly get worse. So it's, it's never, never worse. So adding a feature can make the hypothesis space larger? Adding a feature can and hopefully does make the hypothesis space larger. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> and it's the same case if you're using regularization or not? Ah, regularization or not. No way. Regularization changes the story, and then it's hard to predict. So if you have the same amount of data, and you add a feature, and you use the same regularization, does it fit the, and then the question is, what are we looking at for, because this was talking about training loss, right? So if you add regularization, are we talking about training loss, or are we talking about total regularized loss? It's, it's, it's less well defined. All right.
What else? OK, good question. So same setup. We have a fixed amount of training data. We add a feature. Then the question is, does the estimation error increase? OK, thoughts on that? Certainly the direction seems right. Because when you add a feature, you're potentially growing your hypothesis space. If you have a fixed amount of data, then it feels like you're potentially increasing your estimation error. Yeah, it's all directional at these small scale, but yeah, that's the right intuition. That's the right direction. Okay. All right. Someone was asking about overfitting and underfitting. Um, We know it over. I, yeah, I think um, I don't remember the exact question. Anyone want to ask a question related to that again? What's underfitting? Say again. Okay, so underfitting, roughly speaking, is you're, you're thinking along the lines of small hypothesis space. Yeah, the idea of underfitting is that um, there's some complexity to the prediction function, the best possible prediction function that we're trying to get to. And there's enough data to kind of show that complexity, but the hypothesis space isn't complex enough, isn't big enough to match the complexity shown by the data, to, to match the function that is actually occurring. So maybe we have tons of data, and we see this like really complicated regression function, and all we have are linear functions. So that would be underfitting. Yeah. If we have large error, are we underfitting? Um, large error on training or on test? On test. So large error on test could be overfitting. Large error on test could be underfitting. It could be either way. If we have a big error on training set that feels, well, it could be underfitting. It could just be noise in the data. But the direction is right. Wait, so if three points and they lie exactly on the line, uh, and uh, I, I didn't say underfitting. I don't know. <laughs> Did I? OK. I was asking something about that. About what? Yes. So if you have a small sample, then I mean, the sample, small sample is getting towards estimation error. The fact that your sample may not be a nice representative of the full distribution, that's, that's about estimation error. Yeah. Yeah. Again, please. If you have small sample size, that feels like you might be moving towards overfitting the data. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, the concepts of shrinkage factor is like choosing the coefficients with regularized and the regularized in parts, right? I mean, do we, uh, I, I didn't understand the constraints, like you can choose a particular shrinkage factor. Or is there any such concept that we choose a particular shrinkage factor? The question is, how do you choose? We, I, I, we've been calling them regularization parameters. That's what you mean, right? Yeah. Say again. Yeah, so I think the question is, how do we choose the regularization parameter for things like ridge regression and lasso regression? No, it's about we choose a particular shrinkage factor. I don't, I don't know if I've used the term shrinkage factor, so you have to introduce it to the class.
Oh, OK. OK. Ranges from 0 to 1. Yeah. OK. OK, go on. What's, so what's the question? Yeah. So what is the, what is the, how do we choose the term? Okay, okay. So, okay, so there's two questions in there. One is this, let's take care of shrinkage factor first. A shrinkage factor is just another way to describe regularization parameter. Rather than talking about lambda, which has, which who knows what the units are, they take the ratio of, if you have, pick a lambda, you get your, your w for lambda, so call it w sub lambda. That's your best for lambda. And you can look at the norm of lambda, and then you look at the ratio between the norm of lambda and the norm of the unregularized solution. All right, here's a question for you guys to see if you're following regularization. Um, I compute my solution to a regularized optimization problem. Call it L2, call it L1, doesn't matter. And I compute the norm of my solution. This is linear regression, right? So I, I get a w, a vector. I compute the norm of w. Either the L1 norm, if I'm doing L1 regularization, or L2, if I'm doing L2. And I compare that norm to the, so the norm of the solution I would get without regularization. How do they compare? Sure. Regularization leads to solutions with smaller norm. That's exactly what regularization is doing. It's kind of penalizing a big norm of the solution. Or there's an equivalent formulation if you did the homework 7 practice problem. Uh, where it's exactly equivalent, in fact, to literally constrain the norm to not be bigger than a certain level. Um, anyway, okay. Now, so shrinkage factor is just another way to talk about regularization parameter. And then, how do you choose which one? Same story always. Cross validation, validation set. This is how we choose uh, the regularization parameter. Good question. Yeah. Um, so you want to see an example worked out besides the SVM that we did in class? Yeah. Um, well, sure. Let's do a little bit. Let's do a little bit of something. Okay, yeah. And then there's another method that I have not seen done, but I'm kind of curious about. What's the other method? Uh, the dual problem. Okay. All right. It's a big story, the, the Lagrangian. Uh, no, I mean, it's. it's um, so let's start off something and see where we get to. OK, so what's the problem? Oh, what if we did the Tikhonov Ivanov problem? All right, good. <laughs> OK, so. Tikhonov, so let's start with the Ivanov problem. So this, let's get my notation here. All right, so we have our loss functional 5f. And we want to minimize 5f subject to omega of f less than or equal to r. But we're, let's parameterize by w. Let's consider a hypothesis space instead of um, 
x mapping to w transpose x. All right, so phi of w. All right, so the Lagrangian is equal to phi of w plus lambda. And then in our formulation, our constraints are always less than or equal to 0, right? So lambda times omega of w minus r. Good? All right, so that's our Lagrangian. Now, there's this cool thing that we proved, and I hope you guys can be convinced of this, is that the solution to the original optimization problem can be written like this. Minimum over w, supremum over lambda greater than or equal to 0 of the Lagrangian. But I will write it. Is there a mistake? No. But I'll write it like this. OK. Now let's work this through. So I claim the solution, if I did this, the solution of this is the same as the solution to this. So there's two cases. What are the two cases that we need to consider to see this connection? There's the, so let's break up the world of w into two possibilities. There's w that satisfies the constraint and w that doesn't satisfy the constraint, right? So suppose w does not satisfy the constraint. So what's not satisfying the constraint mean? Omega of w is? Yeah, greater than r. OK. In that case, what's going on over here? This is the key piece here. What's lambda like? Lambda is greater than or equal to 0, right? Lambda is greater than or equal to 0. Now, in the case of a constraint violation, this thing is what? That's positive. That's right. OK. Greater, strictly greater than 0. OK. Now, look here. We're taking the supremum of our lambda greater than or equal to 0. This thing is greater than 0. So this can go up to infinity. All right. So this implies this guy, which is the Lagrangian, L of w lambda is equal to infinity. How about if it's less than or equal to r? So if this is, if this is now negative, what's going on then? Yeah, so if lambda is bigger than 0, this thing is smaller than 0, which makes this thing smaller. So if we're taking the supremum, we want this to be as big as possible, which means 0. So the supremum of this expression is attained when lambda is 0, if this is less than 0, which means uh, the constraint is, is not violated. All right. So if the constraint is not violated, then we get Lagrangian of w lambda, lambda star, lambda star, is equal to phi of w. All right. So, so this justifies this statement, that the minimum of the soup, the min of the max of the Lagrangian is equivalent to the original problem. All right. You guys got this done? If you want it. I mean, it's in the notes, of course. All right, so what's the dual problem, the dual optimization problem? Switch the min and the max. That's right. It's that easy. So I'm going to write, I'll just write max instead of soup. Max of lambda greater than or equal to 0, min of w of same thing. 5w plus lambda. Good. OK. Now, what's the dual function? The dual function. This is the dual optimization problem. This is the dual problem. 
the, solu what the solution, we often write this as d star. So d for dual. The value of the dual problem is d star. And we often write p star for the value of the original problem called the primal. All right. So the dual, this is the dual optimization problem. What's the dual function? Where is lambda? Did I drop lambda? Did I? Sorry. What do you mean, where's lambda? It's here, it's here, it's here. I don't understand. Sorry. Lambda star? I didn't say anything about lambda star. Oh, I did write it for a second. It's, so it was just, I just wrote it because when, for the value, we were, we were talking through the supremum. We were like, oh. At the, when we take the supremum, this thing is going to be 0, or this will be infinity. So I wrote lambda star for, the, for that. And without lambda, you will get to 0 and p star. For a particular lambda star, you'll, yeah, if you plug, that's right. If you plug in a lambda here, and then you minimize over w, you'll get a certain value, not p star. Unless it's lambda star, then you get p star. That's right. OK. What is lambda star? I didn't, well, <laughs> I didn't really define it yet. Sorry. I, I didn't quite get there yet. Sorry. So what's the dual function? Yeah, OK. So it's, the dual function is this piece. What is this piece a function of? What's not fixed in the part I've written? Lambda. Right, lambda. That's right. W is done because we minimized over it. So we call this thing g of lambda. And that's the dual function. OK. So, so what do we want to be able to say about the relationship between the solution to the primal and the solution to the dual? So first, I'm going to simplify the expression of the dual problem. d star is simply the max over lambda greater than or equal to 0 of g of lambda. OK, you ask, what is lambda star? Lambda star is the lambda at which this maximum is attained. So lambda star is equal to arg max of the dual function. One thing I want you guys to note, every single time we're optimizing over the Lagrange multiplier, there's a constraint. Do you see the constraint? Greater than or equal to 0. That's important. So whenever we, we're, when we optimize over w in all the problems we've dealt with so far, that's unconstrained. In the Lagrangian, it's unconstrained. And the dual variable of the Lagrange multiplier for an inequality constraint, we're optimizing is greater than or equal to 0. And why? You already know why. We proved, we justified the why in this whole argument where we showed that this inner, that this primal formulation is exactly equivalent. So that, that you can convince yourself that this is equivalent tells you why you want soup of lambda greater than or equal to 0. OK. All right, where were we? So we have the dual problem. And then there is, so what do we want for the dual and the primal relation? Yeah, we kind of want them to be equal. And what's always true? Yes. It's called a weak duality. We always have d star is less than or equal to p star. That seems like weird and abstract, but we proved that very nicely in two lines. If you go back to your slide, that min-max inequality. Um, there's a Piazza question on it where we really hacked it apart. And should be clear now. All right, but what we, in, in our course, what we're primarily interested in is that we want d star to be equal to p star so that we can just solve the dual instead of the primal. And then what do we, what's that called that has a name when that's the case? Yeah, strong duality. All right, and then can we state some conditions when strong duality holds? Oh, 
OK, the problem must be feasible. All right, so we start with the primal problem. We start with the problem to, yes? OK, so, our, so it's feasible. Yeah, that's a good start. We can do, um, we have a particular condition called Slater's condition, remember? So it's pretty general, but what's the, what's the version of it that applied to support vector machines or something? So first of all, we need a convex optimization problem. So that's important. We don't need convexity for strong duality, but we need convexity for this particular theorem. So Slater's, we have a convex optimization problem. All right, here's an important question for you guys. What is a convex optimization problem? What do you have to check to make sure your problem is convex? We have different pieces. We have an objective function. And now we have these constraint functions. And we need? Yeah, we need phi convex and omega convex. OK? Geometrically, this piece defines your constraint set. Your constraint set better be convex for this to be a convex optimization problem. So that's good. If this is the set of feasible points, if that is the solution to this inequality, that's, that's plausible. If your constraint set looks like this, no way. This is not convex. This is not a convex set. The constraint set needs to be convex to have a convex optimization problem. All right. So your objective function has to be convex, but don't forget to check the constraint set or this. I mean, if you check this, you're fine. You check omega and you check phi, you're fine. Geometrically, the, the feasible set must be convex. The feasible set is the set of W that satisfy the constraints of the problem. That's the feasible set. OK. All right. All right, so Slater is, so we need a convex optimization problem. And we need. So this condition is very simple. We need to find a strictly feasible point. What's a strictly feasible point? Strictly feasible point is a point that's on the interior of the constraint set. So what does interior mean? So you could divide a set into its boundary and the interior. And it needs to be on the interior, strictly on the interior, not on the boundary. That's what you need for Slater's condition. This, yeah. All right. It was a little easier for, um, for SVM, because if all of our constraints are affine constraints, you only need feasibility. You don't even need strict feasibility. So even showing that there's a point on the boundary um, was sufficient. So that was. When someone said feasibility, that was in the case of affine constraints, that's right. Yeah? I didn't understand this, but I mean, I didn't understand it well. So we had, um, we had to find the points that are strictly feasible points, and then we had to find the points that are strictly feasible. Yep. And what's that? Strictly, OK. So what is that set? I will give you two explanations. The first is algebraic. So this is a constraint for the optimization problem, right? W is, is feasible if it satisfies this constraint. It's strictly feasible if it satisfies the constraint with a less than and not an equality. OK? Geometrically, it means that if this is the set of, function, a set of Ws that obey this constraint, geometrically, the boundary, the outermost part of it, is the part where phi of w is equal to 0. And the inner part is where it's strictly less. So 
Strictly feasible is here. Feasible is on the boundary. Sure. Yes? The objective function must be defined in the domain of the, the point that we are showing that it's inside the... OK. Yes, this is, yeah. So you're, it, we, our objective functions are always defined everywhere. So this is, but you're right. Yes, the domain of the objective function must, the whole problem is considered, we look at the, the domains of all of the functions. So the constraint function and the objective function, and we look at the intersection, and that's like, that's the area we focus on. But this is this is a little bit esoteric for our purposes. Okay. X. There's no X. Oh, we're way pat. We're abstract here. We're talking about W are our primary primal variables. Like, where do X's fit in here? Like in an SVM. Oh, I might have had a typo. Are you talking about the preparation notes? You want to show me? Well, here I changed my variable to w instead of x. Yeah, yeah. This is a parameter vector. But that x in there is also an, our same serves the same function. OK. All right. More questions on this, or shall we see what the next step is for duality? All right, so if we justify our strong duality, then we know d star is equal to p star. That's nice. Um, Do you guys remember complementary slackness? What's complementary slackness? Someone should remember, maybe. So there's this pairing between Lagrange multipliers and the constraints. So like here's our constraint function, omega w minus r and lambda. Complementary slackness is that at the optimum, the product of these two is 0. Here. This might be enough duality. Do you guys have some questions on any other topics? The complementary slackness is actually something that shows. You're particularly interested in complementary slackness. All right, let's hit it. <laughs> So let's assume that our optimals are attained. All right. So what do I mean? So, so let's say w star, OK. So phi is our objective. Phi of w star is equal to the minimum over w such that omega of w is less than or equal to r, so minimum over the constraint set, good, of phi of w. So what I've written here is basically I found a particular w star that actually attains the, I could have written infimum, this is the point. So when I write infimum, I don't know if there exists a particular solution, but here I'm saying, yep, there is, w star attains it. OK, let's do the same for the dual. So there we're saying g of lambda star is equal to the, tell me, soup of, oh, now so it's, all right, I'll do it for you. 
soup over lambda, right? And now I didn't write g yet. g is that minimum thing. So g of lambda. Yes? Thank you. Good. Great. All right. So, so I didn't hear you. This is g of lambda star. OK, so we're taking the supremum over all lambda of our dual. All lambda greater than or equal to 0. And that, that gives us a value, like the, the value of the function g. And I'm saying we attain the same value at, at lambda star. So lambda star is the thing that maximizes g. That's what. We care about both. So here I wrote it in a way that, lam that this shows that lambda star is the, is the value of lambda that achieves this maximum. Right. So yeah, we want both. That's right. OK. OK, so complementary slackness is trying to show that the product of this and this is equal to 0. So let's expand this a bit. Let's just write down, actually, let's do g of lambda star again. Let's see. All right, so let's write down the definition. Min of w phi of w plus lambda omega w minus r. All right. Lambda star. This is good? <coughs> this is good. OK. So what I want to do is bring in w star here. So the question is, so the primal is the minimum over w of the soup over lambda. And that's equal to the max over lambda and the min over w. So the question is, in, that, in those inner optimization problems, like soup of lambda greater than or equal to 0, is that attained at lambda star? So lambda star is the optimum for the dual function. w star is the optimal for the primal function. And the question is, are those lambda star and w star exactly what we need to solve the inner optimization problems of the primal problem and the dual problem? This is a question on Piazza also. So let's just work this through. And I think what I just said will be more clear. So the minimum over all w of this expression is certainly less than or equal to the value of this function at a particular w. That sounds right, right? Good. So I'm going to write less than or equal to what w am I going to choose? W star, yeah. OK, good. Now, there's one thing I know about W star. It's that it's a feasible point, right? W star must be feasible, which means what for this part of the equation? This thing must be negative, right? Feasible means that. Omega w star is less than or equal to r, so this thing is negative. This is less than or equal to 0. And what do I know about lambda star? Yes, lambda star is greater than or equal to 0, because lambda, the constraint for lambda is that's be non-negative. So what's this whole expression? Less than or equal to 0. Positive times minus negative is less than or equal to 0. Great. So this is less than or equal to 0 which means this whole expression must be less than or equal to the first term. Because we have phi of w star, and then we're subtracting something from it. So this must be less than or equal to phi of w star. OK. And now is where the magic happens. Suppose we have strong duality. That tells us that the p star and the d star are the same. So that's exactly. G of lambda star is the value of the d, is d star, right? So d star is the mass of our lambda of g of lambda. Lambda star is the optimizer. So g of lambda star is d star. 
right. So g of lambda star is on the left. And on, down here, we have phi of w star. Phi of w star is p star. Good. And they're equal if we have strong duality. So strong duality, all right, SD, strong duality, implies these are all equal. Right? Because if this, if this is equal to this, then everything in between is equal, because it was a stack of inequalities. So that tells us something very interesting about this piece here. What does it tell us about this? It tells us this is equal to 0. Great. So this thing is equal to 0. That is a complementary slackness condition. When you have this Lagrange multiplier lambda star times this, this, this thing, which we, is the left-hand side of the inequality, that that equals 0, that's complementary slackness. There's one other very important thing that we can read off from here, though, which is that we see that now we see that g of lambda star is indeed equal to this piece with w star plugged in. What is this piece? This is the Lagrangian. So let me write this out. I'll never get it back. <laughs> <laughs> so can you guys see down here or no? OK. <laughs> So g of lambda star is equal to, you guys recognize this as the Lagrangian? W L of w star lambda star. This is important. It wasn't, it's not so obvious. It wasn't so obvious to me. It wasn't so obvious to some people on Piazza. You have to really commit yourself with some inequalities that this is the case. Um, what else? We have Strong duality. When can we say we have strong duality? Someone. Com we have a convex optimization problem that is strictly feasible. Strictly feasible means there's a point that satisfies all the constraints with strict inequality. Slater's condition. If there's a question like this on an exam, you could say Slater's condition says because we have a feasible point and the problem is convex. If the problem is convex. You could say that. Yeah. Um, is there something slash I'm wondering what like slash variable. Okay, so we're over time, so I want to let our videographer peace out. <laughs> so you're gonna cut it whenever you want, and you guys can go whenever you want, and I'll go soon too. Yeah. <laughs>